This is the Hello World Podcast, where we talk about habits of success, habits of excellence, entrepreneurship, leadership, learning and development, and outlook that will help us succeed through life. This is Louis Banta, CEO and Chief Trainer of Learning Just Made Better or LJNB. Welcome to the 24th episode of the Hello World Podcast. Our focus in this episode is on letter L, learning. Our guest will talk about how virtual reality can transform learning and development. Our guest leads PwC's XR team, helping clients understand, quantify, and implement the benefits of virtual reality or VR and augmented reality or AR technology. He has worked with organizations across multiple industries and is a regular contributor of thought leadership in the space, giving talks all over the world from Twitter's headquarters in London to the SXSW Technology Festival in Austin, Texas. He's been featured in the media, including the Financial Times, BBC, The Independent, The Guardian, and The Times. As part of his mission to educate, connect, and inspire, he has supported XR initiatives of the World Economic Forum and currently sits on the advisory board of Immerse UK, a UK government-supported cross-sector network for businesses, research, and educational organizations that are engaged with immersive technologies. He's also recently launched an interesting book. It will blow you away. Reality Check, How Immersive Technologies Can Transform Your Business. He also happens to be a chartered accountant, but prefers not to advertise that too loudly. Let's all welcome Jeremy Dalton. Hello world, it's a pleasure to be here with you today. Thanks a lot for having me, Louis. Thank you for guesting in Hello World, uh, Jeremy. And uh, we in LJMB actually have a personal or vested interest for uh, having you here. Virtual reality, I uh, thought before that the only way I can use it is through uh, gaming. Actually had one chance to uh, do VR before, but uh, you know, seeing your book and watching your YouTube videos made us really interested to bring the technology here in the Philippines in or as applied to learning and development. Let's start with the basics, Jeremy. I know that you may have done this in uh, other interviews. Let's go the definition of terms first. There are so many R's out there. What is VR and what is it not as compared to others? It can get a little bit confusing. So you've got all these terms flying about. As you're saying, you've got virtual reality, you've got augmented reality, you've got augmented virtuality, mixed reality, all the realities. But the good news is you only really have to pay attention to two main uh, types of technology. One is virtual reality, and that's all about immersion. It's about taking you to a completely different environment, a different place, time, set of circumstances, and, and engrossing you in that world. Then there's augmented reality on the other side. And augmented reality is where you're still in your real world environments, you know, in your room or your office or wherever, and you're being given an overlay of information on top of that real world, digital images, pictures, text, 3D models, whatever it is that will help you perform actions or tasks or procedures that you're trying to perform in the real world. And uh, you have to forgive me for my uh, ignorance. And I, w- I would remember Pokemon Go for augmented reality as one of the first few uh, versions of AR that I've uh, used. And also refer to some movies that we've watched, uh, you know, as part of pop culture. The Minority Report, Tom Cruise, uh, you know, just throwing in a screens that uh, suddenly pop uh, in front of him. Yeah, While yeah. Matrix, the, the Matrix, Jeremy, is, is VR, right? As early as 1997, Keanu Reeves, The Matrix, 
is VR, yes? Yeah, I mean, the idea of being completely enveloped in a virtual world, whether it's the Matrix or, or even, you know, more accurately nowadays in our, in our business context, in like a training scenario or a learning and development scenario, that is all about virtual reality. Yeah, you're right. And uh, here in the Philippines, I've uh, been in the industry of learning for the past uh, 28, 29 years. And only COVID forced us, forced me to really abandon face-to-face and shift quickly to digital and uh, online. I'm really excited uh, how we and other l and professionals in the Philippines can leverage on the VRS and emerging technology. How can VR enhance adult learning and development? If you can talk of advantages and benefits. Sure, absolutely. So COVID has given everyone a bit of a hard time these days. And, and as a result, I don't know if you've seen um, the, the, the joke chart that's going on around the internet, but it, it asks the question to people, uh, what has driven the greatest transformation in your organization? And you can see the chart, it shows 2%, you know, the CEO, 3%, the COO. CPO. And then, yeah, exactly. And then 95% COVID-19. <laughs> and um, yeah, it, it's kind of a joke, but there is a little bit of truth to it as well, in the sense that it has forced a lot of us and a lot of organizations around the world to start looking at innovative technologies and not even technologies, but even non-technology solutions and ways of working. But XR, both virtual reality and augmented reality, definitely come into that in the sense that they are really powerful technologies that can help bring us together more effectively. They can help us connect customers to products more effectively. They can help us learn more impactfully. So to give you a little bit of um, color on, on all of this, we actually did a study a while back around the value of virtual reality when it comes to soft skills training. And what we found was, was really exciting we already had modules around inclusivity, lead, uh, inclusive, inclusive leadership. And we had content for the classroom and we had content for e-learning packages around that material. So what we said is this is a great base to then use that content and build a virtual reality equivalent of that module and assess our people as they go through those three different modalities and do a little bit of a comparison. So what we found in summary, and there's a lot more detail about this if you want to check out the full report, but what we found is that VR learners were four times faster to train than classroom learners. We found that they were 275% more confident to apply the skills they learned after their training. 275%. Were, 275%. Yeah, 275%. So it was really, you know, sort of, uh, it's, it's, it's super high impact. You're completely engrossed in this world. And actually, that's what led to this, this other um, result as well. We found that they were 3.75 times more emotionally connected to the content than classroom learners and four times more focused than their e-learning peers. And you can imagine why that is. You know, you're completely enveloped in this virtual world there's no there's no windows to minimize and you know uh, other calls to take or or uh, uh, other windows to open you know you're completely in that world uh, for the for the duration of the training period sounds like a very compelling business case <laughs> Jeremy right definitely um, and that's not even the end of it I mean we can go on to it, the costs in a bit you know it's one of the misconceptions but uh, yeah there's so much exciting stuff around this space and uh, of course we would compare VR with the traditional type of classroom training even e uh, learning and uh, you know it's really very, very tough to ask for budget for l d especially nowadays with what's happened in the last uh, 10 months. Uh, but those numbers that you gave are, are also mind-blowing. could be easy to ask the decision maker, uh, your finance and the business leader to easily approve of uh, uh, this one. What would be some of the barriers to convincing, in your experience, to convincing decision makers? You've mentioned the benefits, percentage of learning retention, convenience. If you can walk us through what do we need to prepare for? 
Yeah, so so there are a few barriers, and they are things like um, it is it's a different way of learning in the sense that you need a dedicated device, you know, a virtual reality headset or or other equipment that allows you to achieve that immersiveness. So that is a barrier to entry that we often see a lot of, in the sense that organisations are not quite prepared to make an investment in one headset per person across their whole organization, particularly when you've got, you know, thousands or tens of thousands of people. But the thing is, you don't necessarily need to have one headset per person. You can have a model where you have a, um, a central learning sort of room um, or, or academy, and people can come there to do their immersive training. You can also implement a model where you distribute these headsets to different um, individuals around, uh, around the world or around the country. And uh, you can even do a cycling model where not everyone has to go through it at the same time, but you do a batch of you know, 20 first with your 20 headsets. And when they're done, you move on to the next 20 and so on. So there are lots of different models to, to, to manage that barrier to entry. And I'd say the, the other barrier to entry when it comes to the technology is around the user experience. So in other words, we are not totally familiar with how we interact with virtual reality applications. We're very used to it when it comes to a computer and you've got your keyboard, you've got your mouse, you know, you have to click buttons and you have to click things and you're used to the graph, the 2D graphical user interface. But when you're with a headset, all of a sudden this, the whole uh, protocol has been changed. You know, all the rules have changed. You are now using your head to look around a completely three dimensional environment. You are using your hands, you know, with controllers or just tracked uh, normally without the controllers to access different menu items to type things in to pick things up and click on things so you're far more deeply connected to the virtual world but it requires at the same time a little bit more understanding around how you achieve that so there's some onboarding time that you need to factor in uh, when you implement those programs what do learners say how long does that onboarding or adjustment uh, usually take so from what we've seen, we generally manage onboarding uh, around instructions. So there's onboarding of the hardware. In other words, how do you put on the headset? How do you make it comfortable? How do you calibrate it to, to you as an individual? Um, and, and how do you uh, use the controllers? How do you open an application? Then there's the software onboarding. So depending on what software you're using, you may need to know what different buttons on your controller do, what the trigger does, what the thumbstick does, and so on. Together, all of, all of that onboarding we found doesn't take longer than, than half an hour per session. And you don't have to necessarily do it one-to-one. -one. So it's not half an hour per person. It's half an hour per session maximum. So if you can bring a lot of people in and instruct them one-to-many, then you obviously have a lot of time savings and efficiencies that you can create there. I can see that cost can be both an advantage in a way and it can also be a disadvantage. You mentioned earlier, log logistically, cost of the equipment might be prohibitive, but uh, it's also the ability to really scale uh, learning, to really distribute uh, learning programs uh, en masse that uh, provides that, uh, that cost uh, savings. In the long run, Jeremy, it's more cost saving uh, for mm -hmm. organizations to invest in. Yeah, absolutely. So in this study that we did, we also looked at cost. And what we found that Initially, when you're talking about, you know, 100 learners, uh, you know, or less, then virtual reality, the cost per learner is actually quite expensive compared to e-learning and classroom learning. However, once you start moving up in terms of number of learners, when you get to 375 learners, virtual reality training actually achieves cost parity per learner with classroom learners. And when you move up even more, you know, if you're a large company that's looking at training a lot of individuals, when you get to 1,950 learners, 
VR training is the same cost per learner as e-learning even. So it's quite amazing from that sense. You can get it to those levels if you're clever about how you deploy the technology. At lower cost, given that scale, but at, uh, let's say, three, five, ten times more powerful given the, the percentage uh, of impact on the learner that you mentioned uh, earlier. Uh, yeah. I, I read the case study on Vodafone, uh, presentation skills uh, training. Um, what's the limit to the, uh, with special interest in soft skills, Jeremy, what's the limit to the kind of soft skills that can be covered by VR training? So soft skills is, is one of the big areas of, of virtual reality. And, you, and if you think about it, actually training itself is a massive area. So, and within that you have soft skills and within that you have so many different areas around leadership training, around diversity and inclusion training, um, around negotiation, around sales, around customer feedback and management. There are, and there are, there are some really, really, um, I would say, out there stuff that you wouldn't expect. I mean, companies like Walmart, for example, in, in the US, virtual reality to help people prepare for uh, an active shooter, you know, someone who's coming in and, and, and uh, you know, putting, it, putting a gun in your face. And how do you deal with that situation? So I would say there are, there are so many applications. And when it comes to soft skills, it's such a key area that I don't, I, within that area, I see a lot of potential. And it's not necessarily limited within the soft skills area. It's more limited when you start to think about other forms of training. So the big areas for virtual reality where it makes sense to use the technology is soft skills and, uh, and hard skills or practical skills. When it comes to stuff like, um, let's say, compliance training or training on a, a 2D application, you know, on your computer screen, that sort of stuff, there's no point in really bringing virtual reality into it because you're not going to get a lot out of it. You're just taking something that really belongs in a 2D medium to virtual reality. So my advice would be always consider what the problem is you're trying to solve and make sure that virtual reality strengths as a medium match those problems. So keeping in mind that VR is just a, a platform or a tool or a vehicle in itself, right? that we always have to go back to basics in uh, in learning and training the analysis of the needs no? and then it's of course the principles in design it's not you shouldn't think about virtual reality as um this sort of silver bullet where we're going to move all our training now to virtual reality i don't see that i don't think that should happen at all you should definitely consider what type of training you bring into vr and uh, based on on what i mentioned before in terms of its strengths and of course, that's a very good reminder to companies who may just want to jump into the, you know, the bandwagon. Uh, but Jeremy, you used the word emerging technology. With my research in the past few days of preparing for this podcast, is it still emerging considering that there, there are a lot of cases and a lot of uh, companies who are already in it? It depends on, on who you speak to. So if you speak to a Gartner, and for those of you who don't know, Gartner is an analyst company. They look at uh, a lot of different things within business, including emerging technologies. And they have a, a theory that they, or a chart that they put out every year called the Gartner Hype Cycle. And this is their way of explaining the life cycle or the, the, the path that emerging technologies take all the way from when they're first thought about theoretically all the way through to mainstream adoption. And what's happened over the last few years is that Gartner has actually removed both virtual reality and augmented reality as high level emerging technologies from the chart, um, in a way signaling to the market, um, at least in my interpretation, that they don't see these technologies as being emerging anymore. And you can kind of understand where they're coming from. Because if you go to your local store now, you can buy a virtual reality headset, you know, um, in, in, in the shops, you can go online, you can go to Amazon, 
um, and buy virtual reality headsets off the shelf, you know, and they're meant for consumers. So how can such a technology be emerging if it's so widely available and, and, and uh, in so many people's homes as well? The answer really comes into it when it's not quite mainstream yet. It's, it's right on the edge, on the verge of becoming mainstream, but it's still not enough to be labeled by, to be labeled unanimously as, uh, as a mainstream technology. And so we are doing what we can to educate businesses about the value of the technology, and that will hopefully help to drive further adoption and familiarity with the tech. You make sense when you say it depends on who you're talking to. And uh, based on our limited research here in the Philippines, in this uh, region, um, we, we have not seen uh, any company who is into VR uh, training uh, yet. Would you advise that uh, a company in the Philippines or in Asia who has not yet in VR already start investing in, uh, I would, in such technology? I would definitely take a look at it. You know, it might not be suitable for everyone, but in order for you to really understand whether you can get benefits from it or not, you're only going to be able to, to truly know that and take advantage of it if you start exploring it. So even if you think that there may not be anything for you here, you know, try and go at it with and explore it with an open mind try different applications, try different headsets and other hardware as well. See what makes sense for you. And also, you know, consider um, doing it at a small level. You don't have to go from zero to a hundred, you know, in, in, a, in, a, in a matter of months. You can start small, you can run a pilot program, see how your employees react to it, do some data analysis on it, collect the data and report back on how effective it's been. And that will tell you the truth. You know, that will tell you whether this technology is going to work for you and will hopefully give you some knowledge to take into a future um, result, whether that is to, you know, employ it with the whole organization, you know, tens of thousands of people, or whether that is to say, no, it doesn't work for us. Either way, it's okay. But my advice would be un try to understand it. And the only way to understand it is to explore it firsthand. Yes. And I'm actually imagining uh, um, companies who are doing well, soft skills and hard skills training, the, the biggest pushback that I can imagine business leaders say is I haven't seen it. Uh, you know, the, the lack of familiarity is already a uh, source of pushback in itself. And there are a lot of common misconceptions that people may have about VR, uh, Jeremy. What are the top three misconceptions about this kind of technology? I'm going to, before I answer that, Lou, I'm going to quickly latch on yes. to what, uh, what you were just saying with, uh, with businesses that are, they're not really understanding the technology yet. They're not really uh, getting there with it. And I think, um, you know, that's, it's an incredibly uh, important area for them to bear in mind when it comes to using the technology. Um, it's something that we see a lot to organizations in different parts of the world. And time and time again, because this technology is so unique it's, it's different to things like artificial intelligence and blockchain and the internet of things in that it's a very front end technology. It's a very visual experiential technology. And this is important because you can get an idea of the theory of these other back end technologies by reading about them. Um, and you can get a, a decent idea. But with virtual reality and augmented reality, you really do need to try it firsthand to get a proper understanding. So that's important to bear in mind. Um, you really have to put of, on the headset. Exactly, exactly. You have to put on the headset or you have to, you know, in the case of augmented reality, it's not only about headsets as well. And actually this is in part answer to, uh, to your other question. What are some of the misconceptions? One of the misconceptions is that XR, you know, my umbrella term for, uh, for virtual reality and augmented reality is, uh, is all about headsets. It's not, you know, you've got headsets and they are well understood and are popular at least, but you can also achieve virtual reality through uh, projection systems, you know, on the walls around you. 
you can achieve augmented reality through your mobile phone, through uh, projectors as well. And, uh, and so there are just, there are many different ways of engaging with this technology that might give you different insights and into models that might work for you and your customers better. So that's important to bear in mind as one of the first misconceptions. The other one that we hear a lot of is that virtual reality makes everyone sick. And that's simply not true. It makes some people feel discomfort some of the time to varying degrees, but this is not so different to every other form of motion related technology that we've seen in humanity's history. So even if you go back to the ancient Greeks, the word nausea itself comes from ancient Greek. Nause means ship. And it just goes to show you that, you know, back then and nowadays, you have some people who feel sick when they're on boats. You have people who feel sick when they're in cars, on trains, uh, in buses, uh, on, uh, on, on spaceships, you know. All of these forms of, uh, of transportation or technology, they make ind some individuals feel sick. And in fact, some 2D media also makes some individuals feel sick when you have movies that where the camera is being thrown about a lot. So this idea of feeling a sense of discomfort using virtual reality is not actually limited to virtual reality. It's, it's a fundamental issue of the human anatomy, I would say, and the human physiology. Um, and so that's another misconception. Um, and then I would say a really important misconception, I'll leave this as the last one. There are a few more, but this is a really important one. A lot of people think that VR is a fad, that it is dead, that it has no future. And a lot of people use the argument that it has taken so long to get anywhere that they just don't see it you know, surviving. But they haven't looked at the past so in my book, Reality Check, I actually did a lot of research into the last hundred years of how long we've taken to adopt different technologies. And I did that because I wanted to see, is it, is it similar to how long it's taken us now to adopt virtual reality? And what I found is that virtual reality from when, it's, when it was first sold to consumers has taken about 27 years so far. But things like the telephone, a technology that we still use nowadays, that took 29 years to become mainstream in society. So virtual reality is still not outside the normal range of how long it's taken us to adopt previous technologies. And we are on the cusp of hitting that mainstream point. So I'm, I'm very you know, excited and bullish about the technology and there's data to back out, to back up uh, why I think so and why I'm so positive around it. That's surprising trivia for me, Jeremy, that VR has been around for 27 years already. Yeah, it's actually been around for longer than that, but I only brought it back 27 years because that was the long, the furthest I could go back where I could see that it was sold to consumers at consumer prices. But it's actually been around in digital form since you know the late 1960s. And if you think about it as a concept, the idea of engrossing or immersing people in, in virtual or digital, uh, or not digital, we should say, uh, environments that are not you know, real or not in the here and now, the room that we're in, that concept has been around uh, for you know, since the Victorian times even, and before that with panoramic paintings with these little stereoscope devices that you put a card in front of and you get to see this scene, you know, in, in, in a far more immersive way. So it's just that we've been building on that concept over the last, you know, hundreds of years. And do you think that because of the life changing and world changing pandemic that hit us, it will, uh, VR will also get the boost, will get uh, accelerated as well in terms of adoption? Virtual reality has been accelerated as a result of COVID-19. And it's, it's because of what we were talking about before. It is an innovative way of bringing people together and helping them to work effectively remotely. The good thing is though, or I should say, there's, there's a little bit of a, a nuance to this though. The first thing is that COVID-19 is not the reason for virtual reality's success. 
it is a catalyst, certainly, and it's and it's speeding up the adoption of the technology and the familiarity with it. But it is not the be all end all. When COVID-19 subsides and becomes, you know, a less significant issue in the world, it virtual reality will still have value because there will always be people that need to work remotely and that can't necessarily come together face to face but need to work effectively and virtual reality will be there to manage that need. And you're correct. And I see VR with my uh, limited readings on the subject in the past uh, weeks, I can see that it's really a component of the future of work, specifically in uh, my field in, uh, in L&D. You mentioned about uh, simulations earlier in uh, Walmart, right? Uh, um, I have clients here who post uh, suggestions or ideas on creating simulations of, uh, for example, a bank preparing its employees and, uh, you know, arming, equipping employees on how to react to bank robberies. It would be very difficult to create simulations uh, of, that are really approximate uh, the real life situations. But with VR, I felt, Jeremy, that sky's the limit now on what we can design, right? On any, uh, on any specific skill. And, uh, you know, a lot of people talk about the expense of, of virtual reality, but what is the expense of trying to simulate, you know, such a scenario physically? You have to bring actors, you have to organize everyone to come together in a single place. Um, you have to maybe pay for a venue, you have to pay for equipment. Um, and there are all these expenses that come together. And even when you've done all that, you can't run the, the training program with thousands of people. Those thousands, they won't even fit in the room, you know, where you're conducting the training. But with virtual reality, they all just need the hardware and the hardware can be sent to wherever they are. So in that way, it's actually more scalable than classroom learning itself. And one more barrier that prevented us from you know, pursuing that, uh, uh, that idea was ethical considerations. Because imagine if people really take the simulation to heart, right? And behave in uh, you know, unpredictable ways. But with VR, we can do that with uh, less consequences. Yeah, I would say, you know, the virtual reality is very good at making you feel emotions based on what you're experiencing so if, if i put you on top of a skyscraper in virtual reality looking over the edge you will if if you're like me anyway you'll generally get a sense of fear in the pit of your stomach you know even though you know you're absolutely safe and it's that emotional reaction that really makes virtual reality so powerful but because it's, you know, with great power comes great responsibility. So we have to be mindful of the fact that a lot of people will be uh, very affected when they get into these virtual environments, especially when they are so um, emotionally um, impactful and, uh, and, uh, and impressive. Um, so, you know, that leads you to thinking that we, we might need to prepare some of these individuals uh, for the content they're about to view. And that's something that we do as well. You know, every time we're about to embark on a, an emotionally impactful training program using this technology. You mentioned about preparing the participants or the VR users. You also mentioned about uh, people reporting getting sick because of this one. Would there be health conditions um, that will prohibit people from uh, engaging into VR that they, if they have you have a checklist of these, and if you take one box here, you can't use VR, just use e-learning or other type. What so would they be? It's, it's a bit of a, a spectrum in the sense that we have some individuals who might need uh, a bit of help in terms of accessibility challenges and can't get the most um, out of the technology because of that. For those individuals, we always try to make sure that we have uh, an alternative or a way around that, that they can engage with. So uh, for example, some of our users have hearing aids and depending on the placement of their hearing aid, they might not actually be able to use certain, you know, ear cups for headphones. 
So for those individuals, we make sure that we either have an external speaker or that uh, we have um, earphones that are specially designed so that they go over the actual, um, the actual hearing aid itself. And then, of course, as you move further and further along, you have individuals who um, whose health is actually at risk, you know, when it comes to using the technology. Um, so things like if, if someone has um, a, uh, a, a reaction where they're unable to uh, see uh, strobe lights, for example, without having uh, a seizure or without provoking the possibility of a seizure, you know, it's really important that they're aware of it, not only because some of the content might uh, introduce that, um, a lot of our, I'd say, I, I, I don't recall any content that we've created specifically that might induce that. But regardless, it's important to have that conversation with the individual and also make sure that when you're developing the software and the applications and the training programs, that you bear all of these conditions in mind. And if you can't remove the risk completely, then the next best thing is you have to make everybody who's going through that experience very aware of the mm -hmm. risk so, so that they can make an educated decision on it. Okay. How will this transform the, the role or specific duties or specific functions in learning and development, uh, Jeremy? It's the usual you know, it's the ADI, instructional design uh, steps, analysis of needs. Then you go to designing it, then developing the material, and then implementing it, and then evaluating it. Um, what have you seen uh, in uh, PwC or in other companies in your research? How have learning professionals uh, adjusted, adapted, or transformed? When you get to the designing stage of uh, a virtual reality program, that's when things start to get vastly different from what most learning and development professionals are used to. Because like, like many people, they've got a system or, or a modality that they're used to, you know, the 2D screen in, in front of you, or it might be classroom training. Either way, this is com a completely different modality to what we're talking about now, which is a, uh, a seemingly three-dimensional virtual environment in which you are free to interact with your hands, maybe with your voice, uh, maybe even with your eyes in terms of eye tracking technology. And those type of, those type of inputs uh, and, and outputs require a lot of a change in thinking in terms of how you design and deliver learning and development um, outcomes. So I'd say it starts at the design stage and then it, it carries through to development and even to deployment. So thinking about all the stages of how you implement a, a virtual reality training program. When it comes to development, you've got to have a new skill set of individuals. You've got to have um, you've got to have game engine developers, people who are skilled in using Unity or Unreal um, and engines like that to build these pieces of software. Fortunately, nowadays, we're actually also seeing these no-code or low-code solutions that allow non-technical people to get involved and start building uh, training programs as well, which is really good. So yeah, I think there's I've seen a little bit of adaptation now, but um, the vast majority uh, I think of, of organizations are asking for help from different people, you know, either freelancers or, or, or other external organizations. But once this technology becomes more mainstream and we become more used to it, I'm pretty sure we will start to see all of that talent and that knowledge and learning being brought within the organization, within the learning and development department. I'm trying to anticipate and predict that perhaps in five to seven, 10 years time, even earlier than that, I may need to learn how to do some programming or coding or, uh, you know, also learn uh, game engine uh, design, uh, yeah. of course. You can contribute in different ways, right? You don't necessarily have to be a technical developer, but you can think about the application from a user experience perspective. So when, an, when a person is wearing this headset, you know, how do you make it easy for them to interact with the training program? How does the user interface work in, in virtual reality? 
Um, as well as, you know, there's also the business side of things as well. How do you deal with various stakeholders when, and, and project manage an, a, a VR project to completion? There's so many ways you can contribute to these L&D programs. What would be your top three advice to uh, business leaders, HR, who are in charge of l and if uh, they're thinking of putting up or investing in uh, VR uh, learning? I'm sure that you've mentioned, you mentioned a lot already in our uh, conversation. What could be additional tips, or reminders, or warnings that we can give? Why don't, why don't I summarize some of the ideas that we spoke about and, and put them into a nice, concise form? One of the pieces of advice I'd say is be open to experimentation. Whether it leads to failure or success, it's ultimately successful because you're going to gain new knowledge out of it. So start exploring XR technology and giving it a try. Secondly, don't try to boil the ocean. Don't try to implement a massive program all at once. You, what you want to do is you want to start small, you want to measure how successful that has been, make any relevant changes that you need to, and then implement on a much larger scale. And then finally, just um, enjoy, enjoy the technology. It's, it's tremendously exciting. It has a lot of potential. So I would, I see it as something that is going to really change both our personal and professional lives in the future. So I would advise just getting stuck in and uh, start playing around with it and, and experimenting with it. See where it goes. You, you might be surprised actually at, uh, at the ideas you get once you start playing around with the technology. And even after you know, three to five years, I don't think that those three digit uh, positive impact to learner experience and business results will diminish. And on the cost perspective, Jeremy, just like any other technology, while the cost might be prohibitive now, uh, we, um, one of our team members just bought, bought her VR uh, headset. Uh, I can really understand why it may not be accessible to a lot of learners now. In three to five years, um, I, I please validate, it will go down. The landscape will change drastically in three to five years. And you're absolutely right in the sense that the cost will inevitably come down even more than it is right now. The, the um, devices themselves will become easier and more intuitive to use. And more people around the world will be familiar with the technology. There'll be greater content available. And ultimately, there'll be a greater understanding of what, what it can do which I think will be just absolutely amazing. So we'll be in a really, the, a great way to think about this is right now, despite how super exciting the technology is and how, uh, how much it can impact businesses, this is actually the worst it will ever be. It can only go up from here. It can only improve. So uh, anything you're seeing now, it's going to be even better in the future, which is fantastic. So if we buy, let's say, a, a VR headset now, that will be good for how many years until we need to buy one more? I would say, <laughs> judging from what we've seen, you can probably expect to get anywhere between, I'd say, one to three years out of your headset, depending on how aggressive you are uh, with the technology and whether you want to see it right through to the end uh, in terms of uh, you know, when the manufacturer basically discontinues support for it. So, uh, yeah, it's, it depends on how aggressive you want to be, but we have definitely made a uh, return on investments in, uh, in a matter of less than 12 months. Um, and equally, some headsets, we are coming to the end of life now, but they're more along the 18 months lines as well. Why don't you promote your book, Reality Check, uh, Jer Jeremy? I can see that you have that book uh, behind you. Yeah, I do. I do. Thanks a lot for that, Louis. So for anyone who's interested in this in this subject around XR in business, wants to know a little bit more about virtual reality and augmented reality, check out Reality Check. It's a book I've written, and I've written it assuming you have no knowledge whatsoever of, of the industry or the technology. So you can go into it uh, with, with zero knowledge. You don't have to know anything and you know, I'll take you step by step along the way, show you some corporate case studies from different industries, talk to you about academic studies, reports, 
that have been done that give you some data to back the value of this technology, as well as try and explain and debunk a lot of the myths surrounding it. And that will hope you hopefully give you a bit of inspiration about what it can do and where it's going to go. And you can find out more information about it at realitycheckxr.com and you can grab a copy there if you'd like. The technology in itself might already be intimidating. Jeremy makes it really sound and look so uh, easy. But the book also has a lot of cases, as he, as he mentioned, a lot of photos and images as well. So you can appreciate the vi uh, visual nature of, uh, of VR and lots of numbers, data to really support and help us l and professionals build business cases to get at least the, the pilot program uh, approved. I'm personally excited with this one, uh, Jeremy. I just uh, heard, well, I tried VR once in a game uh, before, years back. Um, last year was really a year of transformation. And I think that transformation will not stop anymore. Um, while the future is uncertain, for me, it's uh, wise to experiment. As you mentioned, that's your tip number one. And uh, my uh, commitment as a result of this uh, uh, discussion with you is to also explore in our team how we can uh, bring this uh, technology in L&D here in the Philippines. That's Jeremy, fantastic. thank you so much for your time. It's been my pleasure, Louis. Thanks so much for having me. I know you're just starting your day there. Uh, day there. Uh, I'll speak to you soon. And uh, for our listeners, please check out Jeremy's Reality Check uh, book. Jeremy, once again, thank you. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye now.